Welcome back. You're watching Captains of Industry. Now, Lord Nigel says he finds serenity when he's gardening and painting. Peace is something that he probably needs, given his reputation for rattling cages about social issues. In his time, he's been the CEO of the NHS in Britain. He's been permanent secretary in Britain's Department of Health. He's authored instructive texts about global healthcare partnerships. He's been an academic at Harvard and the renowned London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Lord Nigel Crisp is our captain of industry tonight. When did you know that healthcare was going to be a big part of your life? almost seems like a calling. Uh, no, in my mid-30s, actually. My early career, I um, was at, worked in industry. Um, I, I, I ran a factory. I, I also worked in charities. And then Margaret Thatcher, another famous British Prime Minister, <laughs> uh, decided that she needed to review the NHS in 1985 and started to introduce people as general managers to bring in some, again, funny enough, more people from the private sector mm -hmm. to bring in some general management skill. Uh, and I was tempted and I came along and looked at it and I found it the most fantastic challenge and, and fantastic because it appealed to me on two levels, one on the emotional level, yeah. you know, actually a lot of people are in healthcare and this includes the managers and the accountants and yeah. people like that, because actually you're making a difference, you can actually do something. Right. Um, uh, and it also appealed to me frankly on the intellectual challenge, you know, this is uh, you think about the changes you will see in the newspapers and the media mm -hmm. of you know the genetics and the yeah. IT and what they're starting to do about mm -hmm. how you can personalise medicine and have drugs designed just for you and not yeah. for anybody else. Uh, the intellectual challenge in this is wonderful. So that intellectual and emotional challenge yeah. have tied me into health, and I found that I've then had a so far 25-year career in health. Off size, you mentioned Margaret Thatcher and many people have a sort of a love-hate relationship mm -hmm. with her because there's that whole issue of uh, Thatcherite economics, Reaganomics, less state, more business, mm -hmm. more free markets and right now as we're talking about how to get out of this economic quagmire, again yeah. we don't know, more state, less state, was she right? I think it was an antidote to where we were then, yeah? end of the 70s, we had an unbalanced economy which was much more geared towards the rights of labor, if you want to labor versus capitalism. Mm -hmm. And this was a kickback, you know. Um, I, we clearly went too far, mm. yeah? clearly went too far. And I think it's really interesting, isn't it? I, I, I'm, in, as we said, in the House of Lords, and in there, there are a number of old labor peers. You know? yeah. Margaret Thatcher's a member, incidentally. Yeah. Um, but some of the old labor peers. And we had that situation two years ago when actually the state had to step in to that ultimate private sector institution, the yeah. bank, yeah. and sort them out. And I have to say, those old Labour people were saying, this is what we wanted in 1948. Yeah. We wanted to nationalise the banks. Yeah. Very strange. But politics swings like this, doesn't yeah. it, right and left? And I think we're now into an era where we've still got that sort of t great emphasis on economics, mm -hmm. great emphasis on economics, probably too much still. I think there's a bit more of the sort of resurgence of, mm. uh, of, of what we need to do together as people. You know, there's a, it goes back to this social mm. solidarity issue. Mm. What we as citizens want from our society. And if you think in purely economic terms, you're just one, yeah. you're just one, you know, one dimensional. I'll tell you what we citizens yeah. want from our governments in Africa is accountability, yeah. is transparency, yeah, yeah, yeah. is just better management of public mm. resources. Why do things fall apart when it comes to these two areas, education and healthcare, just from your vantage point on Africa? I think there's, I think there's a lot of uh, reasons. I think in many places you have still got probably too much expectation that this is just the state's job. Right? Uh, and, and therefore you need to bring in some more expertise. The state has a fundamental job in healthcare, which is to set the framework, to set the standards, uh, to hold people to account, because actually we expect our, our countries to secure healthcare for us, just as we expect mm. them to secure security and defence mm. and, and stability on our streets. You know, it's mm. part of the job of government. But we probably put too much into it. We probably mm. expect too much to be done um, by the state without, a, without enough innovation. I think that's one of the issues. Mm. And then, of course, you know, generalising about Africa must be a major problem because yeah. you do have such different countries yeah. here and such different governments. Uh, clearly, there are issues of corruption. There are issues of corruption in any government yeah. uh, uh, around the world. And you don't have some of those strong civil institutions. Mm. You know, one of the things we have in the UK is, is very strong patients groups, very strong, mm -hmm. uh, the, the really big issue in healthcare, which the NHS wasn't getting right, was helping people to die satisfactorily. I don't mean helping them to die in terms of giving them pills, mm. but when the time comes to die, giving them care that was appropriate right. so that they didn't die 
in a busy accident of department or in a busy ward, mm -hmm. but in a quieter, more gentle mm -hmm. place. And the people who pioneered that were voluntary organizations. You know? In a way, it's a bit like your NGOs, because again, you've got NGOs mm -hmm. in Africa doing mm -hmm. some really good stuff. But these were indigenous NGOs, if mm -hmm. you like. Mm -hmm. So you haven't got some of the civil society structures which provide that balance between you know, state, right. business, civil society. And those need to be built out a bit more, uh, I think. Just before we move on, how did you sort out issues of efficiency? Again, you know, yeah. people, you know, if you listen to talk shows, people will yeah. make statements like, you're more likely to die in a public hospital than in a road accident just randomly walking down the road. I mean, it's a bit alarmist, mm. but there is a sense that things don't work properly mm. because nobody's held accountable. Um, you have yeah. shortages, for instance, in the supply of basic things like, mm -hmm. uh, disinfectants mm -hmm. you know there was a serious case like that in a hospital in in Johannesburg mm -hmm. you have a situation where um, people wait in emergency wards for days on mm -hmm. end just mm -hmm. waiting for somebody to attend to them because there just aren't enough mm -hmm. doctors and nurses to deal with it you know efficiency is a real issue here Yes, and you're describing, though I think it's worse here, you're describing some of where we were in the 1990s in the NHS. We had long waiting times, and when, when I became chief executive, 4% of people died on waiting for a heart operation mm. on the waiting list. Now, 4% doesn't happen now, let me assure you. Um, but So what did we do? Well, we made it very clear, uh, you, you need three things. You need, you need political will, you need determination. None of this gets sorted out in a week, a month. Blair set out a 10-year plan. Uh, so it was at least 10 years, and, and, and we made a big change. We haven't made enough change, mm. much more to do. Um, but you need time to make change, you need vision, you need political determination. You then need best practice, you need to understand what works and what doesn't. So in healthcare, there's all kinds of stuff that doesn't yeah. work. But then you need what you said, which was accountability. And one of the things we've done is we've made our hospital chief executives accountable. We've put into them a local board made up in some cases of business people, uh, but also of local people. So you'll have a mix of you know, uh, the local voluntary organizations and patients groups and business people. Mm. They're the board, and then you've got a chief executive and a, and a top team, and they've got to publish their results. Yeah? Measurement and transparency, really important. So corporatized things. In a way, in a way, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's like that. Um, you've certainly borrowed a lot from, from, from corporate boards. It's not quite the same way in that these people aren't directors and accountable in, mm. in the same legal framework. But you, you, you measure, you make accountable, um, you engage people, um, and you publicize. All those things. And we were very unpopular when we did that. Because um, another thing we did is, is we measured, we set up a star rating system. We measured the different hospitals and we gave them one star, two star, right. three stars, or no stars. Right. And they hated it. We were very unpopular when you did this. I read an article the other day that says Lord Nigel's looking to start a fight. Is that how you get things done, you personally? Uh, I try not to do it like <laughs> that. <laughs> I do think if you're leading, you need to be clear about where you're, where you're starting from. Um, but in healthcare in particular, it is about people and it is about all these stakeholders and there's more people who can say no than yes. Mm. And so I hope that my style has been about trying to bring people together around these ideas and then giving them the space to deliver it. But sometimes the leader's got to say, it isn't good enough. I mean, I, I, I took a few, but you can only do one or two of those at a time. Otherwise, <laughs> you're just a maniac who, who's, who's looking yeah. for a fight. Yeah. Um, but every so often, I'd pick something that I'd make some public statement about. Um, one of them, actually, was racism. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I said, you know, I will support any hospital that sacks anyone for, uh, you know, for racist behavior yeah. in, in the UK. Um, and, you know, you don't, difficult to sack doctors. You know? But some of those stuff, you actually need the leader to be out there a bit in the front uh, mm -hmm. and, and to be sometimes a bit aggressive, but, but that's not my natural style. Yeah. Um, my natural style is much more about, so how can we do this together? Mm. Okay, so outside of healthcare, mm. what is it that you love to do? I read about your love for gardening. Yes. Yes, I, um, I'm an introvert. Uh, and really? that means, yeah, I had to learn to be an extrovert to do this sort of job. Um, I'm an introvert who, you know, this is a big gesture, whereas, you know, for an extrovert, this is a small gesture. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it means that when I'm working, you know, I use a lot of energy. 
yeah. and therefore actually almost all the things I do are things that are actually solitary <laughs> when I'm actually relaxing. So, so, so how, did you, how, did you, how did you transition that? Because I would find it hard to believe yeah. that somebody who would rise through the ranks mm. at the level that you've done is an introvert. Well, I, on the introvert-extrovert scale, I'm on the introvert end, but not very far on okay. it, let, 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 let me be clear. But, you know, when, you, when you're learning, what you do as a manager and as a leader, uh, and as I suspect a television presenter, is you must know yourself. Mm. And, you know, and you observe people, and you can mm. see this person can get something done, this person's got the same skills, but they can't get it done. It's how they handle themselves. Mm. And therefore, one of the biggest things you can do in your career is to, uh, is to get feedback, frankly. And the stuff that people told me, I, I, you, you, you know, when you're a leader, people are never honest to you. And that's the exactly. other trouble, isn't it? They right. don't tell you the truth. They either flatter you or they attack you. Yeah. So you've got to find some people who will... Somewhere midway. Will, somebody who will say, actually, listen, you didn't do that well. Mm. <laughs> uh, and then you don't just fire them. You, know, you have to listen mm. to them. Um, uh, and people gave me quite a lot of feedback about, actually, I need to get better at telling stories about how you get things done. Right. I'm very cerebral. I would give you the argument, whereas actually you've got to tell the story to, to, to engage people's emotion, don't you? You know, that, that, yeah. that sort of stuff. And, and people helped me to sort of think about how to do public speaking and so on uh, oh. and, and f reflect back on me. So I learned to do that so that I'm now quite comfortable. Yeah. But I'm they not also, absolutely terrified. But they also say that you can only train people who are trainable. So there was a willingness mm. inside of you to learn. There was, and, and, a, and a desire to do this. I mean, you know, we're all driven, aren't we, by, yeah. by, by whatever, and, and yeah. um, I wanted to do this and, and learned that that was the way to do it. But it does mean that, you know, my right. safety valve to some extent is, is time by myself. Now, obviously, we're, we're at the end of the program, but in your career, you've met fascinating people. Mm. You've mentioned Margaret Thatcher. We talk about Tony Blair. So you've met a plethora yeah. of really renowned and esteemed mm. leaders. Mm. Who's inspired you? the most and maybe even not any one of these high profile people it could very well be somebody obscure somebody more hidden yeah i i think it is people more hidden i i think probably in my lifetime there's been four or five people who have made me see the world differently in different ways that tell you one which is very relevant to why i'm working in africa is a a, a uh, now elderly professor uh, called Eldred Parry, um, British doctor, um, who's actually been a dean in three medical schools in Africa, um, in, in Uganda, in, in Nigeria, not, uh, sorry, in Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Ghana. Um, and he has this absolute passion for life and the ability just to sort of relate to whoever it is he's relating mm -hmm. to, but still, you know, live his values. Mm -hmm. uh, and he introduced me to some extent to Africa, uh, even though Tony Blair sent me here. Yeah. Eldred introduced me. And then in Africa, I've met some wonderful people who are, mm. who, who are trying to make change happen in such a difficult situation. Right. And they have my enormous admiration. There's so much we can learn right. from what they're doing. Finish the sentence for me. In the future, healthcare in Africa will? Continue to improve by involving the population more in delivering the healthcare. Lord Nigel Crisp, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you for allowing us to probe your mind and probe your heart. A painter, a gardener, an advocate for fair delivery and affordable delivery of healthcare the world over. He's had an illustrious career in Britain's public healthcare system as CEO of the NHS, now an independent member of the House of Lords, our captain of industry tonight.